welcome. It's always difficult to talk before lunch and then to talk after lunch. Uh, but anyway, we'll try and get through this stuff as, as quickly as we can and give you as much information as you need. Uh, I'm Steve Zaretsky, I'm an orthopedic surgeon uh, in New York City. I've been to the conference many times. I see some familiar faces, some new faces. And it's, it's always good to see new faces. So let me know if I go too fast. Um, if you need me to stop, we can ask a question towards the end if we have, uh, have time. If not, we'll have plenty of time for uh, discussion later. So um, Elizabeth Lyons is a, is a, a uh, woman marathoner uh, who also has multiple sclerosis. And I read an article about her, and she once stated that life is really about ability and not disability. And this is my son, Matty, who's taught me this lesson many, many times over the years. He's a guy who tries very hard and never quits. And uh, that um, statement by that woman brought this out to me and makes me feel very emotional about my own child, as, as well as you may feel emotional about yourselves and your relatives who have this syndrome. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the patella, the patellofemoral joint, which is the main issue in nail patella syndrome that I get most of my questions about. We'll talk a little bit about anatomy. We'll talk about the involvement of uh, nail patella syndrome, how it involves the, the anatomic structures around the, the knee that causes patella issues, subluxation, dislocation, and knee pain. As stated before, there are various reasons that you may have knee pain may not be related to nail patella syndrome, such as meniscus problems, developmental osteoarthritis over time, which may be due to um, biomechanical issues, traumatic issues, uh, infections, and other uh, uh, inflammatory types of arthritis. We'll talk about uh, treatment options and certain questions that you may have later on. So the anatomy of the patella, or the kneecap, which you may refer to it more often, is that it sits right in front of, the, in front of your knee. And uh, like other joints in the body, the stability of any, any joint is afforded by the soft tissue structures, the bony, the bony architecture, and the dynamic forces around the knee. So this is a, a netter drawing of the frontal portion of uh, the, the, the knee. And anatomically, this is the top part here, which we call uh, anatomically is the proximal portion of the knee. And as you go down towards the foot, this is distal. Uh, medials are the inside part of your knee. The outside part is the lateral part of your knee, the outside part. So the big muscle in the front of your knee, which forms most of your thigh, is called the quadriceps. It's called quadriceps because it's a group of four muscles. And the muscle uh, attaches to the, to the tibia by a tendon. So muscle attaches to, the, to uh, another bone by a tendon. So in, the, in this case here, where the quadriceps muscle contracts, it extends the knee. So it's really important to understand that because in, um, in nail patella syndrome, some of these muscles may be smaller, misshapen, and malaligned. So it has a, a, a poor uh, functioning the way it pulls on your kneecap. So it may pull your kneecap out more laterally and cause subluxation of your patella, or if it's really severe, it could cause actual dislocation of your patella. Uh, the other medial structures and lateral structures around the knee that help maintain stability of the knee are the, uh, what we call the medial retinaculum, the lateral retinaculum, and there's also a very important ligament that has gotten a lot of attention over the past 10 years or so called the medial patella femoral ligament, which attaches from the center portion of the patella to a portion of the thigh bone. So this is a side view diagram by, again, Netter, who um, kind of illustrates the complexity of the joint and the soft tissues and the bony architecture. Uh, Jeff Towers, we've heard a lot about Jeff, and unfortunately he's not here, but in the Patella study, he did MRI studies, which showed that the um, dimension from the front of the knee, the anterior part of the knee, to the posterior or the back of the knee, from here to here, the diameter is smaller. So what that does, it decreases the amount, uh, it decreases the ability of the patella to act as a lever arm. So what it means to you functionally is that the quadriceps or the, the muscle in the front of your leg that extends the knee has to work a lot harder. So you may feel that on a functional point of view as your leg feels tired, more fatigued. You may have difficulty going up and down the stairs, standing from a squatted position or kneeling. That's one of the reasons why that, that's happened. The other issues are uh, that, that um, 
Jeff found was that some of the muscle insertions, uh, the quadriceps muscles, the insertion may be a little bit different. Some of the other soft tissues around the knee, the insertions may be different. And because of that, the dynamic pull, the dynamic the function of these structures may be abnormal, which leads to more uh, instability of the patella, the kneecap joint. Subluxation, which is partial dislocation, dislocation, which is complete dislocation of the kneecap from its normal position. So in order for everything to work well in the normal situation, all these forces have to act in concert together. And if there's a problem with one portion of it, that can lead to a big pro problem with the whole uh, concept of stability of the patellofemoral joint. So this is just a diagram that shows the di how, oops, I'm sorry, how the different forces act on the knee in order to keep the patella centralized in what we call the trochlear groove, which is basically just a groove in the thigh bone where the kneecap sits. Again, these are netter diagrams which shows the inner portions of the knee. Um, Uh, this is the articular surface, a smooth, glistening surface on the ends of the bones, and this is what, what starts to wear away when you get arthritis. These are other ligament structures of the knee. This is called the anterior cruciate ligament because it crosses in front of the ligament that's behind it, which is called the posterior cruciate ligament. There have been some MRI studies that have shown that in some people who have nail patella syndrome, the anterior cruciate ligament is deficient or absent. If that's the case, you may have instability of your knee when you play sports, or such as pivoting sports, stopping and going, your knee may give way and buckle. Uh, this is a, a uh, post, the posterior aspect or the back part of your knee, looking at the back. Again, you can see the articular cartilage goes all the way from the top, all the way from the front, and all the way to the back of the knee. This is the posterior cruciate ligament that you don't see that well here, but this is the, it's called posterior because it's really a posterior structure in the back of the knee. So this is a cadaver specimen that shows what normal articular cartilage looks like. As you can see, it's glistening, it's very smooth, looks like a plate of glass with water on it. If you have arthritis, the structure starts to wear away, it can get, uh, have divots in it, it can look like sandpaper, and eventually in certain areas of the knee can wear away all the way down to the bone. That's why I hear a lot of people talking, I have bone on bone, I have bone on bone. And that's because this articular cartilage here has worn down to what we call the subchondral bone, which is the bone underneath the articular cartilage. The interesting thing about this, if I, had, if I opened your knee and I stuck a needle into the articular cartilage, you would feel no pain because there are no nerve fibers in the articular cartilage. The nerve fibers uh, are, is uh, involving the subchondral bone. So uh, as you're getting arthritis, this protective surface to the subchondral bone wears away, so the subchondral bone feels more pressure, and because it's feeling more pressure, you feel pain. And that's how that works. And same thing works with the uh, meniscus cartilage we'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, again, this is the anterior cruciate ligament. This is a gross specimen, a cadaver specimen, and the posterior cruciate ligaments. The menisci are in here and in here. This is another uh, uh, diagram showing what the meniscus structures look like. There's one on the inside part of the knee and one on the outside part of the knee. So again, me oh, I keep doing that. So again, the inside part is called medial. The outside part is called lateral. This is your anterior cruciate ligament, posterior cruciate ligaments. And this is a gross specimen. Again, this is if you took your, your thigh bone and you're looking directly down on top of your tibia, the leg bone. Uh, Medial meniscus, lateral meniscus, uh, the structure of the meniscus, how it attaches to the capsule, which is important when you start talking about types of meniscus tears. Meniscus can be torn uh, on what we call the free edge, or it could be done, torn back in this area here, or in this area uh, as well. So we talk about treatment for meniscus uh, tears. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and it really has to do with where the meniscus is torn because there's, in certain areas there's a blood supply where we could try and get it to heal if we try and sew it back together. In other areas there's no blood supply where you actually have to take the piece of the meniscus out. So what's the main function of uh, the patella? Well, it sits right in front of your thigh bone so it protects the articular cartilage from direct uh, trauma. 
So in other words, if you have your kneecap, you fall on your knee, you're going to hit your kneecap instead of your articular cartilage of your thigh bone. So it's really protective. It also acts as a fulcrum. We talked a little bit before about when you have the decrease in the anterior and posterior portion of the thigh bone, that the thigh muscles has to work, has to work a lot more, uh, lot harder in order to straighten out your knee. And the same situation happens uh, in this particular uh, photograph, which shows that the patella here is making it easier for your muscles to function to straighten out your knee. Without the kneecap, the uh, quadriceps muscle must function significantly harder in order to get the same result. So whenever you see a patient, the examination begins when the patient walks into the room. So a physician's going to look at the way, or should be looking at the way you walk, and have you undressed, look at your alignment of your knees, look at your feet, you have to look at the foundation. We were talking about uh, club foot, we were talking about flat feet. All these things add to causing different issues with actually your knee, your back, and everything. So a good physician needs to look at the patient as a whole, just not as a knee or a back or a nail patella patient because there are various things that can be going on, not just related to nail patella syndrome, that can give you musculoskeletal pain. Some of the complaints uh, I'm sure you're all aware of them. Chronic pain, uh, instability of the patellofemoral joint, swelling, stiffness, fatigue, uh, difficulty uh, ascending and descending stairs, squatting and kneeling, and really enjoying your life. So again, we were talking about observation as soon as you walk in the door. Then uh, the examination begins with palpation of the soft tissue structures and the hard structures like the patella. There are certain provocative tests that physicians will do in order to determine the stability of the patella, the stability of the knee, and any areas of a source of pain or tenderness and inflammation. Also, a part of the evaluation should be appropriate diagnostic testing depending upon the patient's complaints and the objective clinical findings. So this, we hear a lot of people talking about their bow leg and their knock need. This is an individual who has bow legs, you can see, oops. bow legged here, so it looks like they just came off a horse. Severe bow legged has to be treated. Uh, bow legged deformity needs to be treated. And one of the things that we could do is called an osteotomy, where we actually break the bone and take a wedge of bone, triangle shaped piece of bone, straighten out the knee, put a plate and some screws in there, get it to heal, uh, and correct, correct the malalignment of the knee. The reason why that is important is because when you have the situation here, you can imagine as you're walking and weight bearing, there's a lot of force on that side of the knee. I mean, that's the inside part of the medial side of the knee. Because there's increased force, the meniscus can be torn, can be damaged. There's increased pressure on the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage starts to wear away. You get arthritis and there's this whole big cycle. So if you can get this early and you can treat it before you start getting degenerative changes and it's severe enough that it requires an osteotomy, that's a great operation to do. So this is the opposite to for me. This is not need, and it's, uh, it's the same concept, but just the opposite. Again, the surgery, if it's, significant, if it's a significant deformity, can be done. But instead of the operation being done in the tibia, in this region, it's done up in the femur. Because you get a better correction from doing the operation in the femur than you do in the tibia when you have knock need. Again, it's the same situation, except for now, you're going to have increased pressure on the outside part of your knee and you start wearing away the articular cartilage and develop arthritis on the outside part or the lateral compartment of the knee. So in nail patella syndrome, what you see clinically is um, flattening of the lateral femoral condyle, which is the superior portion um, of your thigh here, which helps buttress the patella in a normal situation from being pulled out and being subluxed or dislocated. And now if I tell this area is what we call hypoplastic or underdeveloped, and we might see hyperplasia or increased development of the medial femoral condyle, uh, which is not what we see in normal anatomy. So here you see that this, the, uh, the front of the knee is also square in shape because you don't have a normal appearing patella, normal sized patella. The patella in this particular instance is smaller or maybe absent.
So as we talked about, you have absence or hypo hypoplasia or underdevelopment of the patella. The medial femoral condyle is more prominent. The lateral femoral condyle is not formed well either. So that in combination with the uh, issues with the muscles being weaker because you don't have the appropriate um, lever arm, um, uh, smaller muscles, uh, anomalous attachments of the muscles, all these different things lead to the possibility of patella issues, kneecap issues, patella subluxation, patella dislocation. This is a plain radiograph of a normal knee. Uh, this is from the, looking from the front of the knee towards the back. Here you see just normal contours, shape of the bone, and this is a lateral view or a side view where here's your, your femur, the thigh bone, and here's the patella, normal appearing patella and uh, normal appearing tibia, except this person may have had some problems with their tibial tubercle, which is not important in this discussion here. This is an AP projection of a child with nail patella syndrome. Uh, you can see it's a child because it still has open growth plates. This is where you grow here and here as a child. And this is a lateral view. And the interesting thing that you see here is very uh, pathognomonic of um, nail patella syndrome. Here's the patella. So if you go back, think about that other picture we showed, the patella was nice and robust and big. Here the patella is tiny and small. If you look here, right over here, this is what we were talking about before, the medial femoral condyle. It's more prominent than the lateral femoral condyle, which is over here. So you're looking from the side, this is the medial side, this is the lateral side, and normal knee, this is higher than, uh, than the medial side. So what happens is because the patella again is small, this area is hypoplastic, the pull of the quadriceps is gonna pull this patella out towards the side, either sublux, partially dislocated, or completely dislocated. This is another picture with a, uh, a transential view of the patella, uh, I'm sorry, the patellofemoral joint. Uh, which shows that you can see the abnormal shape of the patella, it's like half of it was cut off. But it's sitting well deep into this groove, but again, this is the medial aspect of the knee and this is the, la uh, the lateral aspect. So this is abnormally big and this is abnormally small. So again, as the patella wants, the, as the muscles want to pull this, it wants to pull it directly out that way, which is abnormal position. This is just a radiograph showing a completely dislocated normal patella is here, it's supposed to sit right inside this groove, and it's completely out. And this is a normal knee because, again, you can see that this is the lateral femoral condyle, which is normal in appearance. It's higher up than the medial side or the inside part. This is what it looks like in a normal situation. Nail patella, this would be flattened or smaller, and this would be more prominent. So then just to have, wants to pull it directly out. So. We want to, next part, which is really the most important thing that you guys need to know about really, and now that we've got to pass all the anatomy and the biomechanics, is what do we do to treat it? Very difficult problem to treat because it's, it's not like your standard dislocation or subluxation in a patient who has a traumatic event and they dislocate their knee. We have a lot of different issues going on and it's, multi, it's just multifactorial. When you see your physician, uh, orthopedic surgeon, a, you're not going to find a physician who has a lot of experience dealing with this non-operatively and specifically operatively. So it's very really important that you, you have a discussion with your orthopedic surgeon, make sure he does the appropriate diagnostic testing, which includes MRI study probably from the hip all the way down to the mid portion of your leg, just to see where the muscles are, the shape, the size, the insertions of the tendons, so that when he goes inside to do his surgical procedure, he actually knows where the anatomical structures are. And he's not fishing around, spending time, hours, just trying to figure out and putting piece by piece by piece because he's so arrogant and thinks he knows he can do it because he's done it before in a normal patient. This is not the normal situation. So that's really, that's the most important thing I think you should need to take away from this particular talk is make sure you have a conversation with your orthopedic surgeon. Make sure he's humble enough to know that he's if he has to reach out to somebody else, he should do that, and not to make a mistake that this patient's gonna suffer for for the rest of his life. So let's talk about non-surgical non treatment. Activity modification. Anything that causes increasing pain or increasing incidence of subluxation or dislocation, you wanna to try to avoid if you can. 
physical therapy. I can't talk about the importance of physical therapy. But physical therapy has to be done the correct way. You have to look at a patient as a whole. So it can't be just therapy for the knee. You have to work with the back, the pelvis, the abdominal muscles, the core muscles, everything down from the upper abdomen down to your toes in order to get appropriate strength um, and, so you don't be, and um, conditioning so you don't feel fatigued and tired so you can do your activities of daily living and hopefully move on and do some more fun things that you can do. So anti-inflammatory medications, we talked about that. It's very good for pain, but you really need to be careful. My, my comment before, I like to be cautious. So if I have a patient with anti-inflammatories for a longer than three month period of time, I automatically send them either to the primary care doctor or I send them for liver and, func and kidney function tests just in case something is happening and I could pick it up early. Because the worst thing that I could do is make somebody sick. Other treatments, uh, conservative management for people who start to develop osteoarthritis, whose patella is not subluxed or dislocating, but it's having a lot of achiness and, and pain, are injection therapy. Injection therapy includes corticosteroid injections or uh, visco supplementation injections. You may have heard about them in the past 15 years or so. They've become very popular. Uh, things like Synvisc, hyaluronic acid, um, Orthovisc. There are different types of different companies make different um, different medications. Yeah, and what they are, they're, they're, I prefer a particular brand, not for any particular reason, except for it's only one injection instead of multiple injections. It's called Synvisc One. Um, and what it does, it coats the knee like you're putting oil in your car. So you don't have a lot of that, uh, that sensation of bone on bone anymore. It's like a, 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 a film on the ends of the bones. So that can really help a lot if you don't have severe arthritis and in conjunction with severe malalignment. We talked about severe knock knee or severe uh, varus deformities. It really doesn't work well. It's more for mild to moderate osteoarthritis and mild deformity. And that can be given every six months. It usually lasts about six months. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit that, about that. Um, so once um, you failed, you've tried a good course of uh, conservative management, uh, six months, you're still not feeling well, uh, and the main problem is patella subluxation, dislocation. Next thing you need to talk about is what can I do to fix my knee surgically? Um, well, we could also, let's go back a little bit and talk about bracing. This is a, one of my favorite braces. It's called the patella femoral arthrosis. Uh, this is something uh, that's really I'm fond of because it has this plastic uh, U-shaped uh, um, restraint that can be tightened with Velcro straps. And that goes around the outside part of your knee. So if you, you could actually dial in the amount of tension you need to hold the patella in its proper position. That's a really nice brace. It works relatively well. So that in combination with physical therapy and conservative management, you might do great. So we talked about that. Preoperative planning is key, 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 key. Make sure that's done the, pro the right way. This is Matty playing baseball when he was younger. So surgical options, like I said, we really don't know. We really don't know what the best option is because there's so many different things going on. So this is how I see an orthopedic surgeon trying to contemplate the night before surgery, what they're gonna do, looking at the studies, looking at the patient's file and saying, okay, I'm really not sure, but I have a pretty good idea how I'm gonna apply what we know about normal anatomy to this particular abnormal situation. So soft tissue structures, this is uh, what we call lateral retinacular release. This is done arthroscopically. This is for someone who might have a normal sized patella or a very uh, uh, almost normal sized patella. The patella is sort of tilted over a little bit and having compression uh, pain from too much pressure on the kneecap onto the thigh bone. This is all done through arthroscopic surgery. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but this is just a heat probe which is releasing um, the tissue we talked about before, the lateral retinaculum, which is on the outside part of the knee, causing the kneecap to slide over a little bit. It's a relatively benign procedure. Anytime you have surgeries, things can happen. Uh, but as far as soft tissue structure surgery goes, this is pretty, relatively pretty safe and works pretty well for the right indication. 
So if you notice, here's your patella right up here. And you can see that's normal white glistening cartilage. That's good. So this is a soft tissue procedure which is done in children because you really don't want to do any bony procedures when you're dealing with kids because again it affects the growth plate. If you affect the growth plate uh, part of, while you're doing your surgery, part of that plate may fuse and then you wind up getting malalignment, deformities and all kinds of other issues that you don't want to see. So in kids, if you're having uh, dislocating patellas, you can't treat it conservatively. You could take one of the tendons, one of the hamstring tendons, uh, release it uh, approximately up, up in here and just drill a hole through the tibia. Yes, drill a hole. And then reroute, reroute that tendon through that drill hole and sew it back down. And that acts as a, as a restraint from the patella wanting to be pulled out. So imagine, this is a medial structure. You're uh, tying it around the lateral side. And now when the muscle wants to pull it out, it can't anymore because this is holding it back. Hmm. So this is another type of procedure. This is called a proximal realignment procedure where the structures on the outside part of the knee are tight, but the structures on the inside part of the knee are loose. So this is from chronic subluxation or dislocation. So basically what we're, what we're doing is uh, releasing the lateral tissues and then imbricating or shortening the medial tissues. So we do that lateral retinacular release we talked about arthroscopically, but we could either do that arthroscopically now or open, where you make an incision from here to here. More than likely, you're going to do it open because you have to get to the inside part of the knee to do this imbrication, where it's just pants over vest tightening one uh, structure over the other. So again, it acts as a restraint from the kneecap being pulled out to the side. In some cases, this can be, all, can be done all arthroscopic. So this is a more common procedure that's being done now. It's, uh, we do a combination of the soft tissue release as well as an osteotomy. Osteotomy meaning moving the tibial tubercle here to a more um, medial location. So again, medials inside, laterals outside. So we're taking the patella, uh, the patella tendon, which attaches to the the patella, which attaches to the tibial tubercle, and moving that over more medially, which changes the direction of pull of the muscle we talked about before. And then the second part of the operation is doing that medial imbrication or the tightening of the structures on the inside part of the knee. Also, more commonly, what we do now is when we do this procedure, instead of just moving this from one place to the other more medial, because as you move this tibial tubercle medial, it's actually going more posterior as well because of the slope of the tibia. When you bring it back more posterior, that increases the contact forces between your patellofemoral joint, your kneecap and your thigh bone. So what happens is that over time, it's just more pressure, more pressure over time, wearing away, wearing away, and people found that you start to get arthritis in your patellofemoral joint. So when we do this procedure now, we actually do a little elevation of the tibial tubercle at the same time when we move it over. Yeah. Yeah, you might have. Yeah. So if you had it when you were 16, we'd probably do it a little bit different now because now we found that over time there's more contact forces because you probably didn't have the elevation at that time. So this is more of a procedure for osteoarthritis. If you develop osteoarthritis in your patellofemoral joint, this is a, what's called a McKay procedure, which is a osteotomy, but an elevation osteotomy of the tibial tubercle. And again, we're talking about decreasing the amount of contact force between your patellofemoral joint. So by making a um, controlled break in the bone, taking a piece of uh, bone graft and putting it underneath that controlled break of the bone and elevating the tibial tubercle, it decreases the contact forces or the pressure felt by the patellofemoral joint and therefore decreases pain and the progression of osteoarthritis theoretically. So this is just a radiograph that shows that operation being done. So this is your thigh bone, this is the patella. Here's that tibial tubercle osteotomy with the tibial tubercle being elevated and the bone graft in place. Salvage procedure for patients who have intractable patellofemoral pain, arthritis, um, dislocation is removal of the patella. It's called patellectomy. So if you remove the patella, the same thing happens we talked about before with the AP diam diameter of the femur. Uh, the muscles have to work harder because there's, the, there's no more patella to work as a lever arm. 
So the same thing happens with patients who have a patellectomy. They feel weakness, tired, fatigue, may have difficulty.